Good morning, everybody. It's good to uh, see you all once again. Um, before we go any further, let us look to the Lord in prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us another time to gather together I am not. to hear your word, to fellowship with one another, and to recall your goodness. May your Holy Spirit open our hearts, illumine our minds, so that we may receive the word and let it grow in us. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now this parable is often called the rich man and Lazarus, but I'm using the Latin word divis, so as not to confuse him with other rich men that we will be looking at later on. Now the word divis is actually the, a common Latin word meaning rich or rich man. And uh, in the Christian tradition, uh, this rich man is often called Dives. Yeah? So I'm just using it primarily so that uh, since we are dealing with a number of rich men, we don't want to confuse him with the other ones. Okay, so from now on, we will use the name Dives for this particular rich man and Lazarus. Now the story of Dives and Lazarus has suffered from a lot of misinterpretations. Did Jesus intend to teach us about the details of the afterlife? Are we given a glimpse into the nature of heaven and hell? Uh, these are some of the questions that are often uh, uh, raised and also uh, many people have used this parable to try to answer such questions. So it is because of this tendency to misinterpret that I want to focus on one particular thing. And that is, how are we to understand the story and what lesson can we learn from it? Now, in order to understand the story properly, we need to look at the preceding verses, verses 1 to 14. In this passage, Jesus tells of the parable of uh, the shrewd manager, yeah, which actually was the gospel reading for last uh, for the previous Sunday. Yeah. I want to go through this parable and, and read through uh, this parable because we need to uh, get the story in order to uh, understand this other story that Jesus tells. Let us look at the parable of the root or of the shrewd manager. Hmm. Yeah. Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man, here you see another rich man, whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their homes. Yeah. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 450. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than the people of light. I tell you, Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves 
so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also dis be dishonest in much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have been not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will, uh, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. In this parable, it's interesting that the rich man praises his dishonest manager. Notice in verse 8, the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than the people of light. Now, I want to make it very clear. Jesus is not teaching us that dishonesty is all right. Yeah. The manager is not praised for his dishonesty. And this is clearly indicated in verses 10 and 11, where Jesus says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest in much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Jesus, in fact, is teaching us to be trustworthy in handling worldly wealth and other people's property. And that dishonest manager had not been doing that. So he was not commending him for being dishonest. Now, what is the point of the parable? The point of the parable is that the shrewd manager did something that was commendable. He thinks about his future. And that is what Jesus commends him for not his dishonesty. Jesus rebukes those who claims to be children of the kingdom of God who don't think about their future. And so the lesson from the parable uh, is actually found in verse 9. Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwelling. In other words, the wealth we possess now should be used in such a way that it better prepares us for the eternal future. Or to put it again in another, in another way, if our lives are oriented towards the kingdom of God, we will be trustworthy in our handling of worldly wealth. But if we don't have a vision of the eternal future, we will end up making money as a god. This is why the Pharisees are unhappy with the parable that Jesus told, because we read in verse 14 that they loved money. They are preoccupied with the present, their present possessions, that they fail to perceive the kingdom of God. They are cynical because Jesus' teaching exposes their hypocrisy. Outwardly, they look very holy, but in reality, they are only concerned for the present and not for the future. The description of the Pharisees as lovers of money shows that it is their love of money which causes them to miss the kingdom of God. That's the lesson from the parable of the shrewd manager. And it is in light of this parable that we can now understand 
the parable of Dives and Lazarus. Like the parable of the shrewd manager, the story of Dives and Lazarus is not to teach us about heaven and hell. Yeah. Let us look at the relation of these two parables. In the parable of the shrewd manager, Jesus teaches us how to handle wealth. And in the parable of Dives and Lazarus, he warns us about the danger of wealth. Wealth is dangerous because wealth dulls our sensitivity to the plight of the poor. Second, wealth dulls our sensitivity to the word of God. And third, wealth dulls our sensitivity to the future. And these are the lessons we learn from the parable of Dives and Lazarus. Let us take each of these in turn. First, wealth dulls our sensitivity to the plight of the poor. Notice that the story of Dives and Lazarus makes no mention of any particular evil deeds that Dives was guilty of. He was living according to what he could legitimately afford. He was rich, and so he lived luxuriously. There was nothing to suggest that he got his wealth by exploiting others or through devious means. He was, for all we know, an honest and successful businessman. But the fact that Dives took no notice of a beggar shows how deeply he was ensnared by his riches. Lazarus had become such a familiar sight that Dives no longer noticed him anymore. He didn't do anything for Lazarus. He did not even think about collecting the leftover food for that beggar. He did not notice that the beggar was looking longingly at the crumbs of food that fell from his table to the floor. For this rich man, Lazarus did not even exist. He was just a non-entity, unnoticed, marginalized. Yeah. Let us pause for a moment of reflection. Aren't we very much like Divy sometimes? We live comfortable lives. We are satisfied with the way things are. Or perhaps we are so used to seeing the poor and homeless around us that they don't affect us anymore. We have simply become unaware of them even though they exist. And there are lots of such people, even in what is supposed to be the richest country in the world, namely the United States of America. I took a screenshot of a documentary from YouTube about the homeless in California, the richest state in the United States. And this is not, you know, your Tondo slum. This is actually you know, the places where the homeless live, right in California. In fact, this is in Oakland itself. What makes this state of affairs dangerous is that we may be, you know, perhaps spiritually rotting inside and we are not even aware of it. Yeah. You see, the, the thing about being seeing things over and over again until we are not even sensitive to what we see is that we end up doing nothing. And when we end up doing nothing, we simply degenerate. Just as when we don't exercise, our muscles degenerate. When we leave anything alone, it will collect dust. Yeah. The sparkling silverware that we proudly display in our living room showcase will lose its shine when we don't use it. Yeah. 
the writer G.K. Chesterton uh, made this observation once about simply doing nothing. Yeah. Here's a homeless. He says, if you, if you leave a thing alone, you leave it to a torrent of change. If you leave a white post alone, it will soon be a black post. If you particularly want it to be white, you must be always painting it again. Our spiritual life too will degenerate if, when confronted by the needy, we simply do nothing like this rich man. Riches not only dulls the sensitivity of Dives to the plight of the poor, riches also make him ignore God's word. And this brings me to my second lesson. Wealth dulls our sensitivity to the word of God. In the parable, Dives wants Lazarus to return from the dead to preach to his five brothers. But Abraham's reply is, they have Moses, that is the law and the prophets. In other words, they have the scriptures. Why did he make such a request? Perhaps he thought that the law and the prophets, that is the Old Testament scriptures, were not adequate. After all, he himself had heard the Old Testament scriptures read every Sabbath in the synagogue, but had not given heed to it. He did nothing. So, if someone returned from the dead, maybe the sensationalism would cause his five brothers to believe. The point of Abraham's reply is that if a person had been ignoring God's word all his life, no miracle will turn him around. If people don't listen to the law and the prophets, if people don't listen to the scriptures, they will not listen to anyone, even if that person rises from the dead. You see, all these years, Davis was so taken up with his lavish lifestyle that he did not think too much about God's word and the demands it places on him. The Old Testament has much to say about taking care of the poor, especially the orphans, the widows. Yeah. Because these people had no means of livelihood. But this rich man was enjoying himself so much that he cared little about what the law and the prophets teach concerning caring for these poor people. That's the problem with Dives. Let's once again pause for a moment of reflection. Abraham's answer to Dives is a stark warning to take God's word very, very seriously. If we keep ignoring the word of God, we will find that we are no longer capable of belief at all. The heart has become hardened. Yeah. As C.S. Lewis warns of people who are on their way to hell, yeah. this is what happens to such people whose hearts are hardened. First, they will not, then they cannot. May we not come to such a state or stage in our life where we are incapable of receiving the word of God anymore because we have been ignoring it all this while. The third lesson we learn from Dives and Lazarus is that well dulls our sensitivity to the future. Yeah. Davis reminds us of another parable in Luke chapter 12, the parable of the rich fool. Yeah, here's another rich man, you see. That's why I don't want uh, us to get confused with all these rich men uh, in uh, the parables uh, told by Jesus, especially in the Gospel of Luke. Yeah. Here was a man who was rich, 
and whose heart is so bent inward that he never thought about other people. It's all about himself and all the riches surrounding him. Uh, in Jesus' parable, I want you to notice the nature of this rich man. Uh, the many times in this uh, parable where he thinks only about himself. Notice, he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store up, store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Notice the number of times I, my, myself occur in these few verses. Riches had made him totally self-centered and unconcerned, insensitive to the his own eternal destiny. And this was also the case with Dives. He thinks only of the present. Riches have caused him to focus only on present concerns. As long as life is good now, he cannot be bothered about the future. I'm sure Dives plans ahead like any other good businessman. But like the rich fool in Luke chapter 12, the future he's concerned about is the future of his own luxurious lifestyle. He doesn't plan for the eternal future. What about life after this life? Life may be good now, but what about beyond this life? If we have not given any thought to the future, I'm afraid we'll be in for a rude awakening. This was what happened to Dives. He didn't think about death until death caught up with him. And then he regretted it, but in the end, nothing could be done. The history of Christianity has shown quite conclusively that wealth has never been a particularly helpful tool for serious Christian living. You see, money is like dynamite. It is powerful. If you don't handle it properly, it can blow up in your face. So that over this, God has placed a sign, handle with care. Now, God does not say that we cannot handle dynamite, but most of us are too immature to handle with care. The very fact that we think we can handle it shows up our immaturity. We are like little children who think that they can play with fire when they are told, don't play with fire. It's the same with wealth. Not many Christians are capable of being rich and godly at the same time. If we know how to handle wealth properly, we must learn a very important biblical lesson. And that is the principle of contentment. And this is, in fact, the epistle reading for today. Notice what Paul says to Timothy. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we can be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation 
and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced, pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, learning to be content is not easy. That's why we need to make this particular prayer found in the book of Proverbs, our own prayer as well. Two things I ask of you, O Lord, do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, Who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal, and so dishonor the name of my God. To be content is to be satisfied with just enough, neither too much nor too little. If we have too much, we may forget God. If we have too little, we might be tempted to steal. And this is why we need to make this our own prayer. Lord, I do not want to have too much, neither do I want to have too little, so that I may live a life that's truly pleasing to you. Let me end with some final reflection. <clears throat> I'd like to leave you with three parting thoughts. First, if we don't want to end up like Dives, let us learn to be content with what God has given to us. The desire to have more and more will eventually destroy us. Second, in order to be content, we need to give serious thought to our eternal future. Don't postpone. Or like Dives, we may find it to be too late to change our destiny. And third, if we don't want to end up like Dives, who cares only for himself, let us learn to share what little we have with others, especially the people who are less privileged. Yeah. As the third stanza of our response song puts it, God, whose giving knows no ending, he says, open wide our hands in sharing as we heed Christ's ageless call, healing, teaching, and reclaiming, serving you by loving all. May we make this too the prayer of our heart, not just for today, but for our life. Let us pray. Father in heaven, who do not withhold what is good for your children, teach us to be content, knowing that if you do not give us what we ask for, it may not be for our ultimate good. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.